One of my students told me that she had mentioned to an acquaintance that she was Buddhist. And the acquaintance said, oh, that means you try to accept everything, right? And her answer, of course, was no. But it is interesting that that's the common perception about Buddhists now. We accept, accept, accept. Which is really strange when you look at the Buddha's awakening. If he'd stopped with his first knowledge, seeing how he had been reborn many times in many different ways, he might have taught a doctrine of acceptance, that you had to accept the fact that rebirth went up and down. But he didn't accept that. He accepted the truth of, of the proposition, but the question was, how could you not keep going down? That led to a second knowledge when he saw beings throughout the universe being reborn after their death, in line with their actions. Actions from the past, actions in the present moment. So there you are. Your actions do make a difference. You can act in skillful ways and not have to suffer. Then he wanted to see if you could put it into suffering entirely. That would led to his third knowledge, which is of the Four Noble Truths. And the important part of the Four Noble Truths is that they have duties. Suffering is to be comprehended. Craving its cause is to be abandoned. Its cessation, dispassion for craving, is to be realized. And you do that by developing the path. So things you had to do in order to gain awakening. You had to do all these duties. When he realized that he had finished those duties, completed them, that's when he knew he was awakened. So the waking is all about the power of action, the role of the mind in acting, what goes on in the mind. In other words, your actions are your intentions. They're based on your views, and your views have a lot to do with who you associate with, who you listen to, who you respect. That's the workings of the mind. And then a question of values. What's the best thing to do with the mind that works in this way? We put it into suffering. So it was basically basically saying you have some power, this is how it gets used, how it gets abused, and how you can use it skillfully. So it's not about accepting. You accept the fact that this is the way things are, this is how they work, but then you work them to your advantage. So when the Buddha taught things like acceptance and contentment, these weren't blanket principles. Some things he said you should accept and you should be content with, other things you shouldn't. In terms of contentment, he would talk about how you would be content with whatever food, clothing, shelter you had. As long as it was good enough to practice, it was good enough. But as for what's going on in the mind, if there are unskillful habits, unskillful urges in the mind, you try to abandon them. You don't accept them. You wipe them out of existence, he says. And you don't let yourself stay content with the level of your practice. If there's more to be done. You, you look for a way to do it. Now, this doesn't mean you try to rush through the steps, because some of those steps can't be rushed. But you set that as your goal, and then you learn how to work toward that goal in a mature way. Other things to accept, the fact that there will be unkind speech in this world. And you've got to learn how to train your mind not to be affected by other people's unkind or false, deceptive words. You learn to accept the fact that there will be pain in life. But then again, you don't just sit there with the pain. You learn how not to let it invade your mind or remain. When someone has died, you accept the fact of their death. There's a great story in the Jatakas of a king who is very much in love with his queen, and she dies. And he's so attached to her that he keeps the body around. The courtiers are upset by this. So they 
find a monk who's psychic, who can find out where the queen has gone. Well, it turns out she's been born as this little tiny worm. And so he gets the worm to talk to the king, translates for the worm, asks the worm, do you miss the king? And she, the worm says, oh no, I've got a new husband. Perfectly content with my new husband, another worm. That's when the king decides he can dispose of the body, except the fact that his queen has died. So some things you accept and some things you don't. This fits in with the principle that there are influences coming from your past actions that shape your present moment to some extent, but you play a large role in taking those influences and actually shaping your experience of the present moment. So the Buddha has you focus on the skills you have that you can use right now, and get the mind into concentration, how you get the mind to become more discerning, more mindful. All these skills that we work on as we meditate. So when we find that the mind is not getting concentrated, we don't just sit there and accept it. We say, okay, what's what's wrong? We try to figure things out. The mind would stay with the breath. Is there something wrong with the breath? How about the mind? Is it carrying around some moods from the day? What can you do to put those moods aside? You can change the way you think. You can change the way you breathe. You can change the perceptions you hold in mind. All these ways of fabricating the present moment. This is why the Buddhist teachings take the form they do. There are instructions on how to breathe. There are lots of instructions on how to think, how to talk to yourself. And then the Buddha gives you all those similes and analogies. Those are the mental fabrications. That's guidance in how to develop your skills. It's like being a sculptor. You get a piece of marble. The marble may have some cracks here and there and may have a peculiar shape. And if you're not very skilled, you can't make much out of it. But if you're skilled, you might make something really good. There are many stories about sculptors who tried to work on a piece of marble and just didn't work. And then other sculptors came along and took the same piece of marble and made something really beautiful. So you want to work on your skills right here and now, because they do make a difference. This is, the Buddha said, one of the most important parts of his teaching, that what you're experiencing right now is not totally determined by outside factors beyond your control. I often think that the Buddha taught that karma totally shapes the present moment, and you hear it again and again. What you're experiencing now is the result of past karma. What you're doing now will shape things in the future. But the Buddha actually attacked that view. What you do right now can shape right now. He says, if you don't believe that, you're left unprotected. In other words, whatever comes up, you just have to accept. You have to just sit with it. And it sometimes can be pretty bad. He's basically teaching you that you can change things, change your attitude to what you're doing, change the way you breathe, change the way you talk to yourself, and it will change what you're experiencing. You can change it so well that you can end up not suffering at all, even from really bad things coming from the past. That was the news of the Buddha's awakening. So when you hear that, the Buddhism teaches X. Always ask yourself, how does that relate to the awakening? Of course, you have to be clear about what the awakening entails. Sometimes we're told that the Buddha awakened to the three, three characteristics. Just look, this is the way things are. There's nobody there. Nothing's permanent. And that would be a teaching that would sound like, well, maybe you just have to accept things. But the Buddha awakened to the Four Noble Truths. Now the three characteristics or three perceptions played a role in fulfilling the duties for the Four Noble Truths. That means. There are 
They're meant to be approached as strategies, perceptions. The Buddha never called them characteristics. They're perceptions that you can apply in your quest to abandon craving and to comprehend suffering. But they're in the context of what he did in the course of his awakening. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha left autobiographical accounts of how he attained awakening. It was all about what he did and the good results he ended up, ended up getting by learning from his mistakes, by taking his actions seriously. One of the reasons we may be told that we have to accept things is that people say we're very tender psychologically. We don't like to be judged. And many of us have been judged unmercifully. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't use our own powers of judgment and that we can't use them skillfully or we can learn to use them skillfully. We can get so much more out of our meditation when we look at it that way. After all, what are the Four Noble Truths? They're a value judgment. You abandon craving because you want to get rid of suffering. Suffering is a bad thing. And then you've been creating it because you're ignorant about what you're doing. But you can follow the path. The, the path is something really good to follow because it leads to the total end of suffering. So the Buddha shows you how the mind works and then gives you some good ideas about how to use those workings. He teaches you values. He teaches you to develop your powers of judgment. You can get the most out of these capabilities that you have. 